Welcome to Open Source Spotlight. In Open Source Spotlight, we invite open source authors and ask them to demo their tool. tools. Today we have Justin. Uh, hi, Justin. Please tell us a few words about yourself and about the tool you want to show us. Hi. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I prepared a few slides to go over Ludwig, which is this open source framework for declarative machine learning. Uh, in just a moment, I'll give an overview of what declarative machine learning is, uh, why it's interesting, and then I'll also give a demo of Ludwig to sort of give you a taste of, of how that kind of works. Um, and so first, a little bit about me. I uh, My name is Justin. I'm currently a staff software engineer at Predibase, and I'm the domain lead for the machine learning quality team at the company. I've been a maintainer of Ludwig, uh, the open source project, for about a year. And I've helped with uh, the last few, I've helped lead the last few major releases. And I come from an NLP background. Uh, and before Predibase, I was at Google Research working on natural language generation. So that's kind of about who I am. So uh, jumping right in <clears throat> for declarative machine learning. So when we talk about the state of the world of machine learning today, Machine learning development happens in big enterprises. It falls into one of these two categories. So first we have low level APIs that you know, we're really building custom solutions for your machine learning problem. And then two, we have AutoML solutions sort of in the spirit of convenience and automation. However, both of these styles for machine learning development is not ideal and for different reasons. So on the left side of this world, uh, this involves using frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, uh, and you're basically writing code to implement a machine learning algorithm, pre-process your data, and serve your model. And this is super flexible, and you have really full control um, as someone who writes code. Um, however, this kind of full process from start to finish, uh, depending on where you are, it kind of requires different skill sets. Um, so whether you're sort of just getting started, or whether you're iterating on your model quality or you're productionizing your model, you kind of need to use different technologies and it's a very technical exercise. And so this uh, really using low level APIs requires a lot of time, a lot of resources and a lot of expertise. However, this is also largely the experience of machine learning teams at highly resourced tech companies like uh, Google, Amazon and Meta. Um, cool. So uh, on the right side, you have aspirational no-code platforms. Uh, so these are like AutoML systems, and they really help you automate a lot of the uh, workflows related to, to training. And so this uh, really simplifies the pipeline uh, nicely. And uh, this is really nice for simple machine learning problems, where you can really kind of get a good model in, in one shot. Um, however, typically, that's not how machine learning development works in practice. And AutoML also has uh, this black box dead end problem where you get a model that has, let's say 90% accuracy, but it doesn't mean much. Uh, is 90% good? Um, how do you know it's good, right? And is it possible to do better? And is it possible to get you know, an 89% uh, accurate, accurate model with that's like much more performance, uh, or is it possible to get a 95% accurate model that with you know many more resources? All of these questions are really difficult to answer. And so with AutoML systems, it's uh, difficult to iterate, and also as a practitioner, it's difficult to inject your own expertise uh, into into this process. So this gap between uh, the, these two sides, the level of APIs and AutoML. Uh, today, organizations rely on expertise from data scientists, ML engineers, um, uh, research scientists, and software engineers to kind of bridge that gap. And declarative machine learning uh, is aiming to address this gap head on by casting machine learning into an interface that is highly abstracted, so that's very simple to use, while also retaining the sophistication and expressivity of low-level APIs. Um, so how does this actually work? Declarative machine learning is, as I've written, you know, laid out here, it's defining an end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline using simple and flexible data-driven configurations. So the idea with these configurations is that at a minimum, you're declaring your input and output features, right, with their respective data types. And these configurations have opt-in complexity. So what's not seen here is that there's you know, hundreds more parameters involved, right? but they're sort of un unspecified. And 
what we'll do is we'll define this machine learning pipeline using whatever is explicitly specified in the configuration, but we'll also fall back to smart defaults for any parameters that are not. And so what are these other parameters? So you can do things like specify how to pre-process your data, encode your data, uh, decode your features, uh, which pre-trained models to load from, how to compose your model architecture, um, how, how, to, how to configure distributed training clusters, um, uh, specific training parameters or hyper up parameter optimization. So there's, there's a lot of uh, cool functionality in these other parameters, but you, uh, if you leave them unspecified, then we kind of figure out the best things to use uh, just to sort of get started. And everything in this configuration is backed by Python modules that are using, you know, the low level APIs, but you're not directly exposed to them. Um, and configurations also means it's easy to start, uh, but you know, as you learn more about the parameters that are there, uh, experts can sort of ramp up to very complex and sophisticated uh, configurations. So some history about Ludwig. Uh, Ludwig is what I'll say is the canonical declarative machine learning open source project. And uh, it was created it, at Uber uh, in 2017 by Piero Molino. Piero is also the CEO of Predabase, which is the company that I currently work for. And also I'm wearing uh, the shirt here. <laughs> and so today the project is maintained by engineers at Predabase, as well as an active community um, who help with building new features, review code, report bugs, file issues. And these are all great ways to contribute to the project. So now I'll jump into a demo that I've prepared uh, to go through some of the cool functionalities of Ludwig. Uh, but maybe before I do that, uh, uh, yeah, Alexi, does the sound, does that sound good to you? Sounds awesome. Yeah, cool. So the first thing to get started, as with you know many of these open source projects, you do a pip install of Ludwig. And so uh, we're just going to do that. Uh, I've already installed Ludwig in this sort of virtual environment that I have set up here. Uh, so no surprises there. Uh, but normally, I would take you know maybe a couple minutes. So the first thing that we have in Ludwig is this dataset zoo. And this is similar to kind of like the data sets that are sort of available in Keras, for example. Um, so we have some built-in data sets and this, these come from online or uh, uh, on Kaggle. And so you can do something like Ludwig data sets, list data sets, we get a full list. We can describe the data set. We have some descriptions of what the data set actually is. Once we have our Kaggle stuff set up, we can load uh, data sets from Kaggle uh, from the Ludwig data set zoo. And so something like this, uh, we uh, do a titanic.load, and then that comes into a data frame and we can inspect it um, with the full pandas library that we all know and love. Uh, cool. But for the rest of the demo today, I'm actually going to use this Ron Tomatoes data set. Um, this is uh, available on our Getting Started guide. And so what I've done is I've just downloaded locally, and it's just sort of available in my, in my directory tree. Uh, so this data set is is uh, rather simple. There's you know just these five, six columns, as well as a recommended column, which is what we're trying to predict. This is from Ron Tomatoes. So we're trying to take information about a movie and then try to predict whether or not it is something that should be recommended. Zero is not recommended. One is recommended. Uh, cool. <clears throat> so uh, as we talked about with declarative machine learning, the whole machine learning pipeline is configuration based. So here we're defining a Ludwig config that has a list of input features and the output features. So, um, and to start, I'm going to use uh, GBM models, which is something that we recently added to Ludwig. So this is a tree based model. And with tree based models, uh, uh, you can really only work with categorical, binary and numerical features. So uh, we're have, we have these three features here. Uh, and just defining the config like this. I'm doing yaml.safeload, which just reads that yaml format into a, into a flat dictionary. And then training a Ludwig model is as simple as uh, uh, doing instantiated, instantiating a Ludwig model with the config. And here we're just setting the log info, uh, the log level to be a little bit more verbose so we can see what's happening. And then to actually train the model, you just do model.train and you pass in your data frame. Cool. So uh, right away, we get a printout of some the, a description of our experiment. We're outputting to uh, this 
model directory, API experiment run 11. So you can tell that I've practiced this talk 10 times before. Uh, <laughs> but um, anyhow, so uh, you have the torch version and you have uh, some, some information about the compute that you're using. We're just using one node here. We get a printout of the Luru config. So, so this is what I was talking about with, you know, there's actually, you know, many, many more parameters involved here in your machine learning pipeline. And they're filled in with kind of what we think are reasonable defaults uh, just to get started. But we, you know, respect uh, sort of the input features and output features and whatever else is declared. That's a lot of information. Yeah, it's a lot of information. And the, like all these parameters are documented, but we don't, uh, you know, you, the idea is that you don't really need to know about them unless you unless really I want to. Right? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, cool. So we got some warnings for building our model. We can probably just ignore that. Um, but overall, we start training. And you can see that the accuracy we're getting with this tree model is around 63, 64% um, or so. And so uh, uh, we can sort of scroll to, all the way down to the bottom. Is that scroll. meant to run from terminal? Um, yes. So, so it looks like very like uh, looks like terminal output. Yes, this is terminal output. Yeah, yeah. So we set the logging level to be um, log info, and so this would be printed out to your to your terminal. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, sort of all the artifacts are saved into this model directory, and uh, and then you also get objects returned um, from the train function call. Um, cool. So uh, the model has been trained now, and then we can do model.predict, and this allows us to pass in new data, and then we'll just uh, do predictions. And so very fast, uh, this is a tree model, so it's very quick, and we see that there's uh, probabilities and the recommended predictions, at least for the head of the test set, uh, where we think all these movies are really good. Uh, so, so that's interesting. And then <clears throat> we talked about how there's some difficulty with serving the model. Um, and so uh, we have Ludwig serve, which is a, it's a terminal command that we support out of the box and you provide your, uh, the path to your model. And um, yeah, I guess uh, where we can. Yours was uh, 11, right? Yes, we can use 11 and uh, let's see, yeah, this should work. And this is just going to spin up a, a simple AP, a simple endpoint, uh, 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0, port 8000 for us to uh, query the model. And so once it's up here, I've prepared this post request. Uh, that's a simple curl command to query our endpoint. And we can provide uh, sort of this, these features, content rating, runtime, and top critic, which is our three features of a model. And we turn you know, uh, the weather, some, some data, uh, some JSON data about the recommendation. So by default, the endpoint expects uh, post, like you send it as post fields, not as JSON, right? Yes, yes, correct. So can I send JSON there? Like how easy would it be to change it to JSON? Yeah, so I, I think this is, um, I think this becomes a JSON request. I, I have to- Oh, okay. Go, okay. But yeah, I think we're, we're, the, the dash F is just a shorthand for making this a JSON. Mm -hmm. Cool. So let's see. Um, <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and stop this serving, but I did want to highlight um, th this other option for exporting. So one of the limits of the REST API is that you know you're kind of we're kind of serving on our on our local computer, which is not not as powerful. Um, and so, uh, like if in Torch, the uh, are you familiar with Torch script? Is that Mm, I know it exists. Okay. I mean, yeah. I know it. I suspect it's somehow related to PyTorch, right? Mm. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. That's... I'm, I'm close enough, right? <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. You're you're definitely on the right track. So TorchScript is um uh is this very it's it's <clears throat> I would say it's PyTorch's answer for how to do highly performant. Uh, model inference. And it's so what like happens- It's like TensorFlow serving, but for PyTorch. Exactly. It's like TensorFlow serving, but for, for, for PyTorch, compiled PyTorch in a way. Mm -hmm. So um, 
So if you've ever, if for people who've ever worked with Py, with Torch script specifically, um, it's not always trivial to convert your PyTorch module and your PyTorch model into a form that is actually works mm -hmm. on Torch script, uh, which can run on bare metal. Um, so <clears throat> one of the benefits of Ludwig is that we uh, support exporting to Torch script out of the box. And this doesn't work for all models, but um, where it doesn't work, we are definitely very clear about why it doesn't work. Um, but uh, for this particular model, for example, or I guess we should change it to back to 11. Wasn't it a uh, GBM? Uh, yes, it was a GBM model. Mm -hmm. So how yeah. how does PyTorch handle that? Yeah. It's not a PyTorch, I mean, how does Torch script handle it? Because it's not a PyTorch model, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So the GBM library that we're using is Light GBM. Mm -hmm. And there is actually, so we're, we're actually, for the GBM model specifically, we're relying on some the tort uh, the tort scriptability of that of that specific library, oh, cool. uh, um, but yeah, uh, for anyone who didn't know, there's three models now that can compile into tort script, uh, and uh, that's also something that we just support uh, through the Ludwig interface as well. Um, so yeah, we've exported this model to Torch scripts and in what basically happened is in our model directory we have some extra artifacts now. Um, which uh, yeah, I'll change this to 11 just so that we um, so we, we do torch load and these are our um, <clears throat> compiled torch script files and then we can use them uh, as as usual uh, to do our inference. So something that's cool about Ludwig is that we have this torch script is end to end. So we're not just compiling just the model, the model would be this uh, predictor Torch script module. Uh, we have pre-processing and post-processing and uh, also as Torch script. So you could really run uh, from raw data to prediction completely within Torch script. Um, and this allows us to potentially serve this, for example, on uh, a cluster with GPUs and um, you know the full metal, bare metal aspects of, of, of Torch model serving. Does it also support XGBoost or only Light GPM? Um, yeah, so so Ludwig, we don't have XGBoost yet. Um, but I mean, uh, maybe uh, TorchServe or TorchScript. Um, I think I think that may may exist now. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I I know that that's this is like an active area de of development for for the tree model libraries. Yeah. Just curious, why did you decide to go with Light GPM versus XGBoost? Great question. So at, when we first um, wanted to add tree models, Light GBM was the only uh, tree, uh, the only library that supported exporting to Torch script. Okay, yeah. makes sense. So, Just like uh, in terms of popularity, I think XGBoost is still more popular. Uh, yes, yeah. suspect. Uh, that may be true. Yeah. So that may be true. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have uh, any statistics to <laughs> to back this up. Uh, yeah. Certainly, this would be a great uh, contribution from like an open source user if you wanted to add XGBoost to you know Ludwig. Um, yeah. That would be a very cool project. Yeah. Um, cool. So, I uh, I'll sort of run these. Um, I'll run the cell just to get this started. But I think model iteration is a big uh, value differentiator for for Ludwig. So what's nice about declarative machine learning is that because it's a configuration, it's very easy to iterate. And so in this case, uh, you notice that in the original data set, there were many uh, features that we didn't include, namely the genres and the review content, uh, which are text features. So GBMs doesn't really support text features. And Ludwig, we do, because Ludwig is also a deep learning library. And so here we're using sort of an embedding encoder. And uh, and here we're, we're calling this a set, which is um, basically a sequence feature. And we can train the model um, uh, just as before. So model.train, we get the same printout. And I think, so <clears throat> this is for a deep learning model. Uh, you think about training in terms of, epo uh, in terms of like number of training steps. And so here we have, uh, by default, we're training for 100 epochs for the data, which is about 26,000 steps uh, for this particular data set and batch size. And we have an early stopping policy of five rounds of evaluation. And by default, we're doing evaluation once every epoch. 
And so here you can see right away that we're getting a better accuracy, 66%. And if we scroll down, we can see the training accuracy is kind of shooting up, uh, but the validation and test accuracy is kind of hovering around 75, 74. And uh, so here is 73, so it's actually getting a little bit worse. Um, <clears throat> and let's see what happens here. Cool. Okay. So uh, this is interesting. So we see that we actually had many more steps of training, uh, but we early stopped uh, the model because uh, the training and validation uh, loss curves were diverging. <clears throat> so we sort of finished this, and this is saved to experiment run 12. So early stopping is also this thing that you can configure in a Ludwig uh, configuration. Uh, cool. So uh, what's cool about a deep learning model is that you can use Torch Info, for example, to print out um, sort of the architecture of, of your model. And so here we can see there's like 5 million trainable parameters, and the vast majority of them are coming from uh, our text, our new text features. And you can visualize your learning curves uh, like so. And uh, so there's like out of the box Ludwig visualization libraries. And then um, we also have TensorBoard. So um, let's see, this is going to run with, let's say, okay, so I'll go ahead and stop this. Um, but uh, you can basically spin up a TensorBoard uh, of your model. And, you know, uh, this, is a, this is one they spun up a little bit earlier, but you can, you know, basically get a TensorBoard like this uh, in, in classic deep learning fashion to inspect how your model is doing. We also support a native integration with hugging face models. So if you wanted to do a, a pre-trained model um, with uh, your text feature, you can just specify type distill BERT, BERT, um, GPT-2. There's a variety of uh, hugging face encoders that come out of the box. Cool. And so, yeah, that's, that's that basically wraps up the, the demo. So in summary, um, Quick summary slide. So this is Ludwig. This is the premier open source library for declarative machine learning. And I've given an overview of what declarative machine learning is and why we think it's cool. And if you're interested in contributing or talking uh, more about declarative machine learning, uh, please uh, look us up. You can search for Ludwig GitHub. It's, uh, that'll take, uh, take you right to us. Uh, or you can reach out to me directly. Um, here's like a link for my LinkedIn. And then also we have a Slack um, that you can join. So I'm wondering, who is your main target audience? Is it data scientists or maybe people who are less experienced uh, with machine learning? Maybe, I don't know, data analysts or somebody like who is just learning data science? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So our target user, I would say, is uh, sort of the full range of data scientists. You can have expert data scientists or starting people who are just starting with data science. Um, we also found pretty interesting users who are research scientists who, you know, don't want to deal with the boilerplate of writing, you know, pre-processing code, and they really would just want to iterate on a model architecture. Um, so there's there's a wide variety of machine learning practitioners. That's kind of like our target user, uh, but certainly for helping maintain the platform, these are definitely people who need to be uh, maybe more well versed in um, PyTorch code and maybe are more like machine learning engineers. I'm just wondering what is the a typical pattern of usage. So do I just start a Jupyter notebook and then, uh, uh, I don't know, start this YAML file and then start adding more and more features and then I see what happens and then I experiment with different uh, in feature encoding techniques. This is how you see, like this is how people use it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, you could definitely use a Jupyter notebook, but there's also Python oh, API. People are just writing Python. Uh, there's a there's a command line interface, so some people just use the terminal, right? You can kind of just change a text file of your config and sort of iterate purely within the config. Um, however, uh, yeah, you're you're getting to this. There, there's a, there's kind of like a rich green field of how this should really look in an enterprise in a fully beautiful interface, and I think that's where Predibase comes in. So Predibase is trying to build uh, this. Um, uh, like, you know, very enterprise, uh, very user-friendly interface for, for mm -hmm. Ludwig, yeah. Okay. And uh, when I e experiment in Jupyter notebooks, so usually mm -hmm. like I do, like I have a bunch of things that I copy paste, so like, you know, like any other data scientist. Mm -hmm. And um, 
yeah, when I experiment, I typically use ML4 for tracking all the experiments. So mm. for me, it's quite useful to see like, okay, I now add this feature, I change the encoding strategy, and then I go to ML4 and I see all these different feature sets, different encoding strategies, different models in one place where I can see metrics. Mm. Um, do you have some sort of integration to ML4 maybe, or some sort of a replacement for this experiment tracking? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. So we actually do integrate with MLflow, and we also integrate with this um, tracking called um, AIM. Uh, so uh, let's see, MLflow, AIM, AIM. experiment. Yes. Yeah, I think, so, I, I think I know them. Yeah, I, they even gave a demo too here. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, they look really cool. But yeah, we, we integrate with them, um, uh, comment, AIM, uh, and MLflow weights and biases oh. as well. And we're also working on an integration with Ylogs, not in the experiment tracking sense, but but um, also mm -hmm. we're definitely open to, you know, third party integrations with other open source libraries. Sure. That's definitely if, within the DNA of the project. If any of the open source maintainers watch this now, so please reach out to Justin <laughs> and talk about potential integration. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And I guess as a part of that, so you don't only use uh, MLflow ex as experiment tracker, you also export models there, right? So then if I have some tools that uh, use MLflow's model registry, then potentially I can just use it throughout, right? So I can just take my model from MLflow registry and then use all my, I don't know, deployment stuff and so on from uh, that. Point. Yeah, perhaps. I, I'll, I'll admit I haven't personally used the okay. MLflow integration, but... Um... Yeah, I think more integrations with the, that kind of uh, to do that those kinds of things definitely mm -hmm. be great. Okay, let's see some. Let's say somebody uh, from an open source library is watching this and now they think I really want to integrate with this library. So what are their steps? How do they do this? <laughs> it's a great question. So we have some documentation for our callbacks, uh, but really uh, the thing to do would be like join our Slack. Uh, and uh, definitely come chat with us. Yeah, we have a Slack link here. That you can also click to join. We're really friendly and we try to be very responsive and uh, we're, we're all really passionate about machine learning and making this like a really nice interface for, you know, to bridge the two sides as, as we sort of talked about in the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So definitely reach out, yeah. I'm, I'm curious how many people are working on this? Um, that's a good question. So uh, let's see. <laughs> I would say the the from like uh, PRs from the community, you know, uh, that's sort of a less frequent thing. Um, uh, but you know, people are filing if people are filing issues and reporting bugs, you know, uh, probably you know several times a week. And then uh, we have the the Predibase. We have like a full team of engineers that are responsible for maintaining and developing on the project. Is it the only project you maintain, you develop, or you have some other projects at Predibase? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So we also um, so the CTO is Travis Adair. He is uh, also the lead maintainer for Horvod. Um, okay. uh, That's a library for distributed training, right? Yes, exactly. And this is this integrates into Ludwig as well. Um, and uh, we use Ray for a lot of the distributed um, code in Ludwig, but we don't actually actively maintain that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's sometimes it's the case when the company name is different from the product name, the open source uh, package name, then oftentimes this company is maintaining more than one product. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's uh, that. It's a very on-spot observation. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, what are your plans? What do you want to work on next? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So uh, we're working on a 0 0.7 release. And a part, as part of this, we're working on developer API annotations. So right now uh, in Ludwig, it's kind of, uh, it's unclear which functions are specifically ones that are quite stable and which ones are, you know, uh, can be refactored and, and, and changed a lot. Um, so we're working on just sort of the annotations there. Uh, we're working on pre-trained vision models. So we have we've integrated with Hugging Face for you know all these pre-trained text models. Uh, but for vision models, there's actually some cool pre-trained models from Google as well as from PyTorch. Um, and so so that I think that's a big project. 
And then we also aspirationally have this idea that we want to support self-supervised learning in Ludwig. And um, there's a lot of interesting ideas there for uh, saving encoders and um, loading from pre-trained encoders specifically within Ludwig. Uh, yeah, but pretty yeah, interesting. That's the flavor of some, some ideas that we're mm -hmm. thinking about. Okay. Do you have any advice for anyone who's watching this? Any advice? Uh, <laughs> well, um, let's see. Machine learning is really cool. And uh, I think it's uh, the the beauty of machine learning for me is seeing a model get better and iterating on a model. And so that's kind of what drove me into the project itself, because I thought that the configuration interface for machine learning pipelines, it was just so elegant. And um, so, yeah, advice is uh, everyone has their own machine learning journey, I would say. And uh, if you come across Ludwig and you find that Ludwig is a good way for you to do to approach machine learning, um, that would be cool. But also uh, the world of open source and machine learning is very big. Uh, so definitely go out there and explore and find out for you what is best. Okay, great advice. Thanks a <laughs> lot, it was a pleasure having, having you here. Thanks for mm -hmm. the demo and uh, um, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, yeah Alexei, it was great to chat with you and thanks for giving nice. me the opportunity to, to speak on, on Ludwig, yeah. Okay, yeah, bye everyone. All right, bye-bye.